Hey folks, welcome back to The Peaceful Way. I am here with the great Tim Mohn. He's the, the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada. Um, he's also the host of the Liberty Experts podcast. Is that right? Did I get that right? You betcha, you betcha, yes. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, check out his podcast. It's actually pretty good if you want to get... Um, a good primer on the libertarian philosophy and uh, what it, exactly it is they believe because there's a lot of um, myths out there about what the philosophy is, I think, and a lot of misconceptions. Um, is there anything else you want to plug there, Tim? Uh, well, I am planning till it's Easter Sunday. So happy Easter, by the way, and uh, namaste. I don't <laughs> know how to, I'm just trying to think of the most peaceful greeting I can here. Um, <laughs> I, I am launching, hope, hoping to launch today a new website called timmowen.net where I'll have all my podcasts, videos, articles, and uh, events, and hopefully some merchandise and different things uh, up there. So uh, I would love uh, for you folks to check that out, give me some feedback, and uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. Sweet. Yeah. Um, I'm sure by the time this is up, if you're doing that soon, that'll all be up too. So cool, yeah. man. Um, so uh, I just wanted to get, we'll talk about some kind of more current events, but let's just get into some basics. Um, so this podcast, kind of what I'm trying to do with it is all I'm really, it's nothing, it's more like a passion project. And I'm just trying to explore, like, how do we create a less violent and more peaceful world? you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I think one of the biggest questions we have to ha ask is how does that relate to the government and the state and how do they make our situation more violent or less violence, maybe some people would think. Um, but uh, I know libertarianism is one of those philosophies that really seriously asks those questions. What is the role of the state and the role of the government? Yeah. Um, so can you just give me maybe a quick and dirty on, on what libertarian, libertarianism is, what is the philosophy, and why yeah. is it important for peace, for a peaceful world? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, our, our, the, the philosophy, I think, probably fits right in line with your show here, because ultimately, uh, that is our goal. We want a more peaceful world. Um, and so libertarianism is simply says, you know, it, it if I was explaining it to someone in kindergarten, it would be don't hit people, don't uh, take their stuff. And um, that rule also applies to you if you get elected into government and if you work for government, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. And, and so uh, we point out the fact that government is an institution that has a mandate uh, to use violence and um, violence is not the answer to most of our problems. It's only the answer in a very few circumstances. You know, you can use violence to protect yourself from violence. In other words, if someone's trying to take your stuff or hurt you, okay, then it's acceptable to use violence as, uh, as maybe a last resort or a way to protect yourself. Uh, but it should not be the standard way we get things done in this world. We shouldn't issue threats of force and uh, back it up with real physical force if for non-compliance. And that's exactly what government does. And so libertarianism, we say, look, we want a more peaceful world. And the first place to start with that is let's restrain government because that is the, a giant corporation with a mandate uh, to use violence. And that ought to be restrained um, to those few circumstances where violence is acceptable if that makes any sense yeah totally uh yeah that's a pretty good uh, way to put it i think um what you even said a little thing you said there it's like a corporation and um uh, i think that's a good way of understanding it they're basically just the biggest corporation with the most amount of guns and power <laughs> and so yeah, yeah they're the ones we have to submit to right so right. uh do you think like to me and, and I'm not necessarily um I this podcast isn't necessarily like a libertarian podcast but I do want it does seem difficult for people even sort of peace advocates to sort of accept the premise that uh the state 
is is force and that's all they are they're just they're just right. an organization that has a monopoly on the use of force and they're uh and to the state the state is a hammer and to them everything is kind of a nail right and all the only mm -hmm. weapon they really have at the end of the day is they can force you to do it they can coerce you they can use non-peaceful and violent ways to or means to sort of get you to do what they want like but even just that premise it's hard to get people to agree on that premise even if you yeah. let's say you're like you think it's a necessary evil or something but even that i don't see a lot of people even accepting that premise that it's a necessary evil it's more just uh it's not violent. It's not coercive. It is, it, it's, uh, we all sort of implicitly agree to it. Do you think, do you like, how do you get past that and just get people to like sort of agree on certain premises about what the government or the state is? Yeah, that, that is, that's a tricky one. And if I had a clear cut answer, you know, I, we'd be having a lot more success as a party, I think. Um, yeah. But you, you, because you're right, people seem to elevate the state or the government to, um, to some sort of sacred or magical uh, entity or abstraction, right? But at the end of the day, the government is just made up of, it's like Soylent Green. It's people. It's just people. It's, yeah. you, it's like you and me. The people that are in government are no different than you and I. They're not any more special. And yet they are claiming this right that you and I don't have of using force. And in fact, yeah, people, because of, various reasons you know a big chunk of this i think is is kind of the the programming we get in public school or government school um that that kind of paints the state as this virtuous uh kind of god almost godlike entity that lords over us you know and and um you know this is why i, I often call uh you know i notice i'm an atheist but i notice a lot of my fellow atheists they, they get rid of one non-corporeal entity and they replace it with another one called the state. I call them statheists. And right. <laughs> they, they treat the government or the state just exactly like they would treat a, a, a god, like a Christian would treat a god or something like that. Um, and, and they use it you know, to justify all these things. So the first thing I point out is, look, the, these people aren't any more special than you or I. Uh, and if you don't think I have the right to do these things, if I can't extort money from you, even if I call it taxation, uh, then why do these people get to extort money from you and call it taxation? Uh, if I can't lock you in a cage for smoking a plant, then what makes you think these people can lock you in a cage for smoking a plant? When is it okay for me to use violence? And there's only a few cases where I can use violence. And, and so you can argue that, okay, uh, rather than me use employ violence in those situations, I'll ask the government, I'll, I'll uh, delegate that, that right or that authority to the government to protect my, my, body and my property from people that would do violence against me so government should protect us from theft from fraud from assault from rape from murder from all these things good yeah do that but limit yourself to that so it, but it, but it's very difficult to get through to people um about this and so you know i i really don't have the answer you know i think i've come to believe and I, i've actually believed this for a long time and it's one of the reasons why i was very hesitant to get into politics to begin with um, is that politics uh, and, and government is downstream from culture. So what happens in our own homes and in our own lives is out of that emerges the government and our beliefs about it. And so what's more important to me than getting elected is shifting culture and getting people to do this because it's a culture that demands it. And, and right now we see this everywhere. You know, people are demanding that the government protect them. They, they want the illusion of security more than they want freedom right now. And that is, why is it that they want that? Well, there, there are all sorts of reasons why, but it's that demand for go that government do something that causes the government to use violence uh, because we're demanding it. And so to me, a big, big part of um, ch changing culture is looking at the man in the mirror, first of all, and finding out, am I a man of my own principles? You know, and, and a big pill for me to swallow was, you know, shortly after I, adopted kind of libertarian philosophy or accepted it <laughs> as okay this makes a lot of sense and i can't refute it um and you know one of our our principles is you should sh thou shalt not initiate force against someone which means don't use violence against people um only ever use protective force 
Yeah. Uh, well, I found I, I had to look in the mirror and notice what I was doing in my own household with my children. I wasn't the most peaceful parent there was, you know, I'd send my kids some time out. So I would threaten them with spankings. I would do all the things that were the norm for me growing up that I, you know, how I was parented, I was parenting. Right. And, um, and so a big part for me was understanding and trying to wrap my brain around how to be a peaceful parent, how to uh, remove force from the equation. And it was difficult, man. You know, like the, the first year it was, it was easy enough to, to refrain from, issuing threats to my kids that was easy enough but but i had to take it a step beyond that now and because you know all the behaviors all the bad behaviors i was seeing where i would say stop doing that to your to your sister or you're getting a time out or you're getting a spanking um i was still seeing that same behavior that wasn't changing even though i took force off the table so now i had to get down at their level and and think more like an entrepreneur and say hmm. okay how am I contributing to this problem? What, what needs aren't being met here that this kind of behavior, and it almost always came back to me and right. what I was failing to do. I wasn't stepping up to be the father I needed to be, right? And so it was when I realized I need to be more engaged in their lives. I need to be more active with them. I need to be more connected with them. I need to understand the world through their eyes and help them meet their needs that, you know, then I started getting real respect. And, and then when I would give advice or suggestions, um, they would listen to it because I had earned that respect. So, so the, my point here is that this is very difficult, right? Government is a magic pill. Like we just think, okay, if we just snap our fingers and government just implements a law or a policy, things will get better. We'll finally have the utopia we want, but it's much harder than that because yeah. it requires people like me who even understand libertarian philosophy and principles, having to figure out how to apply them in our own lives and in our own homes. And that's extremely difficult, even for someone who understands the philosophy, let alone someone who doesn't even get it or isn't even concerned about living a principled life or, or you know, is just kind of marching on to their, the beat of the drum that culture has imposed on them, that their childhood environment has imposed on them. You know, a lot of us, and I, I count myself in this, we, we just have kind of been almost living unconscious lives where we're just playing out of a set program and we're not even aware that we're doing it and and we're not even aware that we can we have free you know that we don't have to do that right so it's tough yeah for sure uh yeah and i think that's uh that's kind of interesting because um <clears throat> well okay i'm and i work in kind of an industry which i would say the bent is more to, it's like a social services kind of thing that I do. And the bent is definitely more towards um, more government kind of progressive politics and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and uh, it is, I am always struck by the unwillingness for a lot of people who espouse these I, sort of ideas of, of, um, sort of what the state should do, uh, big government programs and all that kind of stuff. And I am sort of amazed at how unwilling they are to like actually put that, put their money where their mouth is, right? Like they think that the government should be doing all these, um, say welfare programs or uh, uh, provide healthcare, but I don't really see it. Like they're some of the like almost most selfish people I know. And uh, they, they're not really uh, willing to have skin in the game. Um, and, and in some ways for like a lot of socialists, especially I would accept, I would be kind of more like willing to accept what they say if they actually had skin in the game, but almost none of them do. It's always, it's always sort of this sort of abstract idea that the, this, uh, like you say, non-corporeal entity, the government should be, sort of providing this and there's no question of the mechanisms behind how the government provides that and then but there's also no like talking about how do i actually live that out in my life like i don't see these people necessarily living in communes or redistributing their own wealth or right. or taking in the sick you know like it's it's yeah. always the, the they're trying to push the responsibility onto someone else but what i hear you saying is kind of like a breath of fresh air because you're like no i can't just espouse this idea as um an abstract concept but it's more 
uh, I actually have to put these ideas into practice and and apply them to my own personal life. Yeah. And uh, like, how do you, I guess, I don't know how to put this, but how do you, I, I think that gives people credibility and your own philosophy credibility because it's more than just an abstraction. It's actually something that, that is practical to use. And um, how do you, um, I guess like, is there other techniques, other ways that you can live a more peaceful life uh, and live a less, uh, like a more nonviolent life? I don't know if that's the way, best way to put it, but like trying to get at, um, we can't just be shouting from the sort of like preaching from the rooftops or from our soapboxes yeah. about this philosophy, but we actually have to put it into practice. And I hear you saying like peaceful parenting. Are there any other like techniques or practices you would, you would say that would help move the needle towards um, a less violent society that doesn't feel the need to uh, just, you know, point guns at people and tell them what they must do? Yeah, this is a great question. And I mean, obviously, this is something that I think a lot about because my whole political career, if you want to call it that, yeah. has been focused on this idea. And the whole reason I got into politics wasn't so that I could win an election and think that I could legislate um, some a more peaceful society because I, I just think that's naive and is not practical. It's not going to work. You know, I think that you're constrained by culture, that you, you have to tell people what they want to hear if you want to get elected. And you, so I, I've taken a completely different tack because my metric is a more restrained government. And that comes from a, a culture that is, is uh, taking on more responsibility for itself and is less demanding of government. And so what I've been doing more and more is focusing on uh, this idea that liberty equals freedom plus responsibility and so hmm. by that i mean it's it's not we, we've been focused on freedom from coercion from political coercion specifically uh quite often as libertarians to our own detriment because we're missing the other half of the equation which is personal responsibility right because let's assume that i can't do anything about political coercion at all let's let's just assume there's no way i can even influence the outside world and then i'm just stuck with the world the way it is forever and that the statism is just going to continue to ramp up. Does that mean that I have have no liberty? Does that mean that I'm a victim here? And this victim mentality is pervasive in culture. It's pervasive in, you know, we can talk about how it's pervasive in, in my profession and how it led to mental, mental health problems for me and different things and how I see it causing mental health problems for other first responders. But I focus now on personal responsibility more and more. What can I do and what can I help others to do to get more personal responsibility in their lives to become better versions of themselves? And I, I think maybe that's where there's more, uh, that's a bigger leverage point than trying to um, persuade people that their, their sacred beliefs about the state are wrong or something like that. Uh, now I still do that. I can't help myself. You know, I still um, point out errors in thinking and try to promote clear thinking and different things like that. Um, but I, I think that there is something in the idea of, of what can we do to take more personal responsibility? So what are some ways I can take, get more liberty in my own life? Well, some of the things I do are try to try to eat nu nutritious meals, right? Uh, right. Because a healthy body is going to be uh, free to do more things. Let's say I, I go to, I, I lift heavy things in the gym and, and I, I work out regularly because again, a strong body is going to be able to be more resilient and anti-fragile and be more free to do more things. Um, and, and, you know, I, I focus on first and foremost, uh, and when I'm having, when I'm living my principles as best I can about taking responsibility. And of course I continually fall short. It's a continual struggle. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, I practice gratitude and I think about all the things I'm grateful for in the world because I know it primes my mind. It puts me into um, an optimal cognitive state. I, I studied this uh, part of my grad degree in self-organizing systems and leadership. Uh, I came across all this research on mental states and mindset and it's well documented mm. and it's, you know, this idea that gratitude poises your uh, cognition on what one author called the edge of chaos where all sorts of possibilities can emer are, are, can emerge okay i want all those possibilities to emerge and my brain needs to be in an optimal mental state to have that creative energy 
and and to be able to tackle the complex problems and opportunities that present themselves in life. And so when I wake up in the morning and instead of looking at Facebook and getting angry at all the mean things people are saying about me and uh, the way the world sucks, if I put that, I'll just go to, just, just go to Twitter, man. That's even worse. Yeah. Just go to Twitter. Yeah, exactly. It's a cesspool, right? Yeah. So to me, these are the, the a thing I can do to take personal responsibility is make a proper decision in the first thing in the morning to practice gratitude so that I, I kick more ass in the day and have more, uh, more freedom in the day uh, right. to do that. If, if I don't do that, my freedom gets limited. So, so I, I am trying to focus more and more on personal responsibility and trying to connect people with that by, by starting with the man in the mirror uh, than I am, uh, you know, and I'm trying to get away from this constant temptation to point out all the, all the bullshit out there and, and all the poor thinking and all the false beliefs and stuff like that, because ultimately, uh, you know, it, this kind of comes from my Christian background is, is like we were taught, it's not about preaching, it's about living your being being a witness by the way you live your life kind of thing. Right, yeah. right. And so if you if you are embodying authenticity, integrity, freedom, responsibility, and all these things that I value in my own life, if I embody that, and people see it very clearly, then um, whatever I, I talk about will be become more attractive to them. And they'll, they'll uh, want to learn more. Uh, because ultimately, you know, someone once asked, you know, like libertarians are like, it's like being the leader of libertarians, let's say, is like herding cats. And they're yeah. right. I mean, we're all very independent minded. We're not pack animals. We are independent, right. our own way people. Right. And so chasing libertarians around with a stick and saying, you have to do this and you have to compromise on that. And like that creates more chaos and <laughs> right, right. than anything. And so, but what I have learned growing up on the farm is the way you, you organize cats is you put down a nice warm saucer of milk and they all not just come there following their own self-interest right right and so um leadership from providing value um is is what i think we need to do and quite often as libertarians we chase people around with sticks we, we say that's a wrong idea whack bad and we whack down one mole and two more pop up and then we have to whack those down and for every two one we whack down two more pop up so now we're doing this unending dance of arguing when to me, I think what's more effective is finding ways to provide real value to people, things that they're attracted to, things that can help them in their own personal life, things that will give them freedom right here and now and, and focus on those things. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's uh, and that's I think that's such a good take, because even if if you want to like live a less violent and more peaceful life and you want the world to be less violent, it it's funny. I don't think again, people kind of think in abstractions rather than thinking on like a very personal level and even thinking as much like your own physical health. What's the, uh, what's your mental state? You know, are, do you have, um, a chaotic and non-peaceful, uh, even dare I say violent mental state, right? Where, uh, your, your thoughts are all over the place. You're unfocused and that kind of stuff. And I think, it really has to come down to a very personal, it has to be very internalized before you can uh, take on the deluge of um, uh, ideas and stuff out in the world right. that comes with that. You have to have a very uh, strong internal state uh, in order to withhold that or withstand that rather. Um, I, yeah. I was, I was yeah. hearing you, uh, you sort of mentioned um, a little bit earlier in your uh, last little riff there about uh, you were working on the front lines and um, things I can't remember exactly what you said but you said there's like a lot of victim mentality and stuff yeah. in the front lines. so just could you just uh, say what you do and then maybe elaborate on that a little bit to what you were getting at there sure yeah, well, I'm a firefighter paramedic, and uh, you know, I've I've been in this career since uh, for my entire adult life, so over over 25 years now. And um, you know, I remember when I first got into this field, uh, my one of my first calls was, you know, I was being mentored by these two kind of grizzled old paramedics, and we went to this uh, house fire. This it was actually like a little hermit's cottage or something like that, and um, and it was fully engulfed and we just kind of were there standing by to help the fire department the volunteer fire department out and then once the smoke cleared and the fire was out we noticed there was a body 
in the in the rubble and um and it was my job as the junior guy to go in there and bag this body and and you know get it get it out of there basically <laughs> and uh, it was it was the most gory thing you could imagine i mean this guy was burnt uh that all that was left was basically the, the only skin left on him was his butt um, oh. his legs were burnt off from mid femur down his arms were burnt off from mid humerus down um, oh my his, goodness you could see his rib cage and all his internal charred internal organs his skull it was just a skull uh, attached to that and uh and i couldn't roll him over he was stuck down to the ground so i had to, had to get a pole and pry him up off the ground <laughs> and when i did that the back of the skull came out and all his soupy brains kind of poured out oh. onto the ground and i caught a whiff of uh, oh, his intestines goodness. kind of flopped out a little bit and i caught a whiff of his like burnt bowel juices or something and i just started gagging and i went off to the side and was like dry heaving for about two minutes trying to compose myself and i kind of looked over at these guys and they're like come on they're like get it done proby and so i'm like okay so i went back i finally got the job done but, you know, on the way back uh, to the station after that call, they noticed that I was kind of like, I didn't know what to make of this. I was pale. I was quiet. I was like, what, how, what, how do I make sense of this thing that I just saw? Right. And um, the guy turned around to me and he, he looked at me, he said, uh, first crispy critter kid. And I, <laughs> I started laughing. I'm like, oh, my God, that's so dark and inappropriate. And like, <laughs> what is going on here right and then he noticed that that's he, the word you know, they use <laughs> yeah that's i'm like i've never heard that before and then then he's like what do you do you fellas feel like uh barbecue ribs for lunch or anything and i'm like oh my god like i just there was something about that that was horrifying but also very admirable you know and i'm like i want to be like these guys be able to shrug this kind of thing off like how did they do it right and the, and the guy took me aside at the station afterwards and said look he said you know we, we use this kind of dark humor behind closed doors in private to, um, to deal with this kind of stuff. Cause we're, we're going to see, you're going to see all sorts of human tragedy in your career. And if you let this stuff get to you, you're going to burn out very quickly. And, and right. so what he was teaching me in that moment, and, and, and then he said, you know, you, what your response was normal. Like we all have gagged and, and had to compose ourselves at times and, and been, you know, had to, yeah. And he said that that's normal and you did good because you, you dealt with it and you got the job done. Right. And that made me feel really good. It's like, okay, yeah, you're right. I did something really hard. I restored order to chaos, even though, and it's precisely because these things are hard that I actually signed up to, to do this work. I want the harder the call, the better, the more danger, the more complexity, the more, whatever, the more challenge there is to overcome, the more meaning I get from uh, overcoming it. Right. And so, so what he taught me there was, was a mindset of kind of clinical detachment. Like you have to separate the problem from the person and, and that's going to help the person the best. Um, he, right. he, taught, he taught me all sorts of things, but now cut to a few years later when I'm graduating from my advanced care field and i'm and you know and by the way that year working with those two guys was one of the best times in my life because we i couldn't wait to go to work and i couldn't wait for more calls like that and right. we would high five afterwards and like yeah that that was an awesome call there was lots of gore and trauma and we knocked it out of the park and you know they taught me how to focus on all the things i could control and all the things that i was doing great rather than focus on all the things i had no control over the human tragedy that had just occurred I, I couldn't have stopped that. That's why they called us because a tragedy occurred and right. now we're just trying to restore order to chaos. Right. So it, it was great. I had that mindset, but now you cut back to a, a few years later, I've graduated from my advanced care paramedic and now I'm with a very progressive kind of um, service where, uh, you know, we go, you know, one of the first calls I go on, it was a mass casualty incident. So multiple cars, multiple deaths, multiple critically injured patients, it was a triage situation where our, our system was overwhelmed and uh, I thought we knocked it out of the park. We, you know, couldn't save all the lives, but uh, we made a huge difference. And I felt great about that call, <laughs> you know, cause all my training, you know, it would have been worse had I not been there. Yeah. And, and so I'm feeling kind of pumped about this. And uh, our, our chief says there's going to be a mandatory debrief afterwards at station one. So, I'm like, yes, we're going to go there and talk about all the ways we kicked ass and what we can do to be even better next time. Uh, and, you know, that and what we did wrong and blah, blah, blah. So I walk into this debrief all cheery and I look around 
and everyone's sat dour faced. They're they're looking down, and the it looks like I walked into a funeral or something like that. And it turned out it was something called a critical incident stress debriefing. So this was at this time is right when mental health started coming becoming into our consciousness as a, a threat, let's say, to first responders, and they wanted to right. deal with this psychological threat. Um, and so, sir, listened, and sorry to interrupt you there. Isn't there yeah. like a lot of concern about PTSD, particularly with paramedics? Like I've Absolutely. heard, I've heard p- people talk a lot about that. So I, I, I don't know. Is right. that yep. kind of, is that kind of the reason why they were doing this? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're recognizing that um, some paramedics and some first responders are suffering psychological damage from the calls that they went on. And, and I could see how this could happen. Like, for example, if I didn't have these two old vets with me on that first call, Lord knows how I might have responded to yeah. it. Right. And interesting. They, they yeah. Focus my mind in the right way and gave they, me. Yeah. They kind of almost, they almost like kind of change your psychology around it a little exactly. bit. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And so, but what happened was, so in this room, I'm listening to all my colleagues talk about all the things that they couldn't control, right? How these people died and how tragic it was for their family and how it, how that made them feel about thinking about this tragedy, how that made them feel. And I'm like, shit, I, I'm a monster. Like I had (laughs) had the totally wrong attitude about my profession coming into this room. And you're right. I mean, people did die like this, this is horrible and we couldn't do anything about it we were absolutely helpless to stop some of those people from dying and here i am thinking about what a great job we did and what what does that say about me right and so by the time it got around to me yeah, i was i was worked up and i was sad and i was traumatized essentially <laughs> by this call and then shortly after that i had um i had three kids in the span of about two months die uh in my care um they mm. they just suffered traumatic you know, there's nothing I could do to save their life or anyone could do. And, uh, and that, that, you know, that destroyed me. Like I wanted to quit my career. I couldn't look at my kids. Uh, oh man. I got flashbacks. I hit yeah. the bottle. I had severe anxiety about going to work. I, you know, luckily my employer sent me to a therapist. Um, and it was one, one session and actually one question in that session that turned off my PTSD. And that question was, I was going on and on about how I, I couldn't, I was completely helpless and I, I provide no value. Like I can't even save a life. How, why did I get into this? And he stopped me and he says, I want to stop you right there, Tim. Are, are you telling me, and I'm just asking this as an objective observer here that's trying to grapple with what you're telling me. You're telling me that you didn't provide any value on those calls. Is that true? And I'm like, oh, I, it stopped me in my tracks. And I thought about it. I'm like, okay the parents all hugged me afterwards and they thanked me. What were they thanking me for? If, if I were in their shoes, would I want a paramedic like me? And the answer was yes. What, what would it be that a paramedic like me would be doing on those calls? Well, they'd be doing everything that I didn't want to do for one thing. They'd be giving my kid the best chance to survive. Yeah. They would be talking me through what's going on and preparing me for the worst and doing all these, you know, and I would want that as a parent. So obviously I provided all sorts of value. And I right. realized in that moment that I'd been trained by this culture of victimhood to think about all the ways I'm helpless and to think about yeah. all the things that are outside of my control and to imagine myself as a victim of these circumstances that I right. can't control anything. When instead, what I should have been focusing on was all the ways that I had control in all the things I could control in that call. And how could I leverage those and provide even more value? And how could I improve even for next time and and that made me now excited to go to work and now these same calls that in the past would have broken me down and caused me to quit my job i feel like they actually make me a better person a person a better version of myself so i, I call it an anti-fragile mentality hmm. and those two old vets didn't realize it probably but they instilled that anti-fragile personality in me that first year just by how they focused my mind and told me how to deal with things and yeah. how to think about these calls um, but then that was all erased by the, the victim industrial complex, let's say, uh, <laughs> that want me to think of myself as a victim and totally helpless. And, right. and so it's no, to me, it's no coincidence that right now at, at a time when we have unprecedented amount of mental health resources, uh, where our systems are more robust and we have more resources to bear on calls, 
uh, that we are also seeing an increase in mental illness and suicides among huh. first responders and paramedics. And so it, to me, it's, it's not the calls that are causing this trauma. It's how we think about these calls. And that story is put there by, you know, what I loosely call the victim industrial complex. Yeah. And, and this victim industrial complex is through all society, right? And when I hear my colleagues say, management needs to do this, our, our members are suffering and we're blah, blah, blah. And I'm hearing that mentality, that fragile mentality that is putting them at risk of mental health problems. Um, yeah. and, and I hear that same thing in culture writ large everywhere, right? When people say the government needs to do this, what you're saying is I have no agency, I have no power, I have no way to influence this. I, ne I need my government to look after my neighbor who just lost his job. No, yeah. I, I need to go over there. I need to knock on his door. I need to offer him some food. I need to say, how can I help you? Like I have the power to do that. I, and, and, and that is a very empowering message. Whereas it's very disempowering to look, look at my neighbor and say, no one's helping him. This is bullshit. Like this is our society. Right. We need government to implement more programs. It, it just feeds back on itself. So uh, I, that's what I was getting at when, when I was talking about, and, and to me, this is what, what we're seeing that this victim narrative grows the state because of that, right? In yeah. the same way, the victim narrative in my fire department grows uh, psychological programs and management budgets and all these other things uh, to deal with the problem. Uh, and the problem, by the way, continues to get worse <laughs> despite of that, or maybe even yeah. because of that, um, we're seeing that in society writ large. So I expect to see a growing victim mentality at the same time we see the state growing at the same time we see. Um, you know, all these uh, adverse effects of people not taking personal responsibility. You know, it used to be that people would take responsibility for others in their community. They, they saw it as their duty to help the poor, to help. And now I see, we, we often get 911 calls, people will report a fire. And I remember one call, I'm, I'm going to be the first arriving uh, fire truck. And I was the officer, which meant I was going to be the incident commander. And, um, I was looking for more information. Was there anyone in the house? How involved is the, is the fire? And dispatch gets back and says, well, uh, the caller uh, didn't stop. Uh, he was just driving by and noticed the house was on fire. I'm like, so, so you, you don't have a common human decency or a sense of responsibility to knock yeah. on the door at least <laughs> and just say, hey, get out of your house. The house is on fire. Well, we get there and it turns out it was just the, a reflection of the setting sun in the window that he thought was a fire or whatever. Oh. Right? <laughs> so here, here we roll rolling four fire stations through rush hour traffic, putting all sorts of people in jeopardy to get to this burning house. And again, that, that has to do with people not taking personal responsibility. Then two days later, the entire town of Fort McMurray was shut down when, um, when someone noticed a little girl being hauled off of a playground by a man and she was kicking and screaming and didn't want to go. Well, instead of confront the man and say, hey, what are you doing? A call was placed to 911 and they treated it like an, an abduction and the whole city right. was placed on lockdown until they sorted out what was happening. Okay. Well, it turned out to be the girl's uncle taking her home for supper and she didn't want to go home for supper. Oh, yeah, and yeah. That could have been avoided <laughs> simply by, so, yeah. you, you know, th this is what I mean by let's take personal responsibility and, and the people don't have any sense of that. And it's, and especially progressives and socialists who love big government, they seem to like, you know, you observe, they seem to have less sense of personal responsibility than every, anyone else. There's a government program for that. So this is like learned helplessness. It's victim mentality. It's, and, and it, it gets worse and worse, the bigger government gets, because why would I help my neighbor out if I know there's a government program that will do that? And that, that degrades our communities, that degrades our society, that isolates us into our own houses, atomizes us. Because if I don't have any sense of responsibility to the people around me um, the, or connection, if I don't need to have any connection, that, that distances us, right? And, and so that, that is a side effect that uh, all, both reinforces big government and is caused by big government at the same time. It's a positive reinforcing feedback loop uh, that, and, and you notice it, has accelerated like 10 years ago you would have never guessed that people would have been happy and begging to be completely isolated in their homes right now where they can't even touch their family members or yeah like th this is atomization taken to its logical extreme and it's probably only going to get worse uh so yeah anyways that's end of rant yeah <laughs> no that uh that's good um i think uh 
it is interesting you say all that and um i am wondering like uh okay so when we are when we encounter something that makes us afraid you know like our reptilian brainstem just like takes over and we start yes. ma- we, we start becoming very irrational uh we make mm-hmm. decisions that uh, we wouldn't normally make our our sort of uh, time preference becomes very very short, um, and yep. and uh, and it it's just kind of a recipe for especially when we're talking about large swaths of people, it becomes a recipe for um, really bad behavior. And I think history uh, shows us this more than anything. What happens when kind of people are afraid and mob rule takes over? Uh, and in light of kind of uh, current events, and I, I've been, I've been, um, I've actually been listening to some of your podcast episodes about it, and and uh, reading some of your Facebook posts, and I think you have very clear thinking, which is kind of hard to find these days uh, on the current uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, and uh, how how do you like what do you think is the best approach anytime we are anytime let's say the crowd is uh screaming at the top of their lungs there's a crisis how do we think clearly about it and how do we um stop sort of the muddy thinking around these ideas yeah no, there's, that's a great great question you know it's I, I think it's very difficult to uh, go against the mob, right? It, it puts us in danger. I mean, I think this this is probably one of the reasons why zombie uh, zombie movies and shows are so popular in in pop yeah. culture right now. It's because people that show any signs of life or <laughs> non group think uh, everyone wants to eat their brains and bring them down to their level, kind of. Yeah, thing, right. It's and a very so good a metaphor for have. sure. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and so it's frightening. You know, I, I've held back from saying a lot of things because of that fear and um you know it it, but one thing i've learned is uh, again my profession i've had the opportunity to learn how to deal with fear um i had a you know i was trapped in a basement fire once and where i knew with every fiber of my being i was going to die and i was going to die horribly and i i was not making good decisions that would have got me out of that fire at that time I was tangled up. I needed to think methodically about getting untangled. And it wasn't until I took some deep breaths and thought clearly and, and just started working the problem that I was managed to get myself out of, out of that, uh, fires like a hoarder's house. And, and it, it was, it was pitch, but like smoke was so thick, even with a flashlight, I couldn't see my hand in front of my mask. Oh boy. Um, so it, it was like the worst thing ever. And I started to feel my skin burn, like everything right now. I still have, but here's the thing that that day was a defining moment in my life because I realized deep down in my nervous system, it became very apparent to me that I'm a mortal being that I'm going to die someday. And while I was in that basement fire, all sorts of regrets flooded me. I wasn't the type of father I needed to be. I wasn't the man. I, I, I wasn't espousing my principles. I was just kind of following a career path and a life trajectory that was laid out there that I, I just kind of was marching autonomically through and, and wasn't consciously deciding. I, I left a lot on the table in life and I hadn't reached, lived up to my potential and all these things flooded me. So that was a life defining moment for me because it was after that moment when all these opportunities opened up because I said, screw everything that is not meaningful in my life. Let me focus on everything that is. And I started living a life of meaning and then opportunities started opening up themselves. I worked with Neil Young and Daryl Hannah on a film project, which got me (laughs) national attention, which then led to me being leader of the Libertarian Party, which I never imagined or had any ambition to be, which led me to all these speaking gigs around the world and and meeting people and being this cultural influence. Like all these things happened from that house fire. Now, I still have on the job, I still run into situations where I, I have that I'm brought right back to that house fire and that fear and that panic grips me. Uh, it'll be a training scenario or a particular incident. And, and it's, you know, like you see those Vietnam flashbacks where people are ducking because they hear a backfire or something like that. Um, same type of thing. And, and that fear can paralyze you. I could let it paralyze me. But one, one of the tricks I've learned is that 
as soon as I feel feel that panic hit me, it it triggers it, it triggers me to remember that that was the best day of my life when my life changed for the better. Hmm. And I'm feeling excitement right now, not panic. Yeah. And and then and then I start operating at a higher level than had I not been triggered. And so this is what I, you know, we could call it post traumatic growth or something like that. Hmm. Uh, it, if it's a post-traumatic disorder, you panic, you, you shrink into a ball, you make all the wrong decisions, your mind closes off. But with me, with that little brain hack, um, everything opens up for me, all, all sorts of new possibilities emerge. And you can use that fear uh, to your benefit. So how does that apply to this situation? Um, again, it, it, it's like, like everyone else, I am afraid, right? I'm afraid of this virus. Like, I, I don't know what's going to do. Um, and, you know, I can remind myself that, um, that that fear means I'm alive and that I am able to engage with the world and that I can get excited about engaging with the world and go going to work, for example. Uh, you know, if, if like what what is in it for me to go to work right now? If, if everyone is telling, if what everyone's saying is true, that this virus is the killer and that everyone's dying, why should a healthcare worker even go to work? Right. Um, <laughs> right. And so, and so, uh, but, and, and it applies to everyone. Like, why should I go to the grocery store? Why should I leave my house? Or why should I go to a concert or all these things? Um, yeah. Well, you know, again, you, you can let the fear paralyze you or you can use it to engage higher functioning. And say, okay, there's there's this perception of fear out there. Is it true? What can I do to live the best life I can despite all all the things that are going on? And all sorts of possibilities start to emerge to you. Now, if everyone did that, like I, I've often said that if everyone had the ability to manage their own anxiety and take personal responsibility for their own inner world, their own internal state, their own anxiety and fear, right? You almost wouldn't even need to to promote libertarian philosophy right because people, yeah. it would just become natural to people they they mm -hmm. would just say yes i have agency here uh, just no matter what the external world is doing i can find meaning happiness and freedom in this very moment i'm living right now and if everyone did that um these systems of control would fall apart um but yeah the the, the trick is well how do you promote that and again to me i think it comes down th this is what i'm trying to figure out right how do i promote that how can i how can I connect that with people in a way that's powerful and attractive and that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't have the answers, <laughs> For yet, sure. but uh, you know, I'm just going to keep trying different things until something connects so, with people. So uh, zooming out a little bit um, uh, more back to the sort of policy side, what, like, do you have an opinion on uh, what, a government or societal response should be to a pandemic or what would be like a libertarian uh, response to a pandemic? Yeah. Um, so this, this is, you know, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the, the philosophy of liberty, these enlightenment values that the individual is sacrosanct and that protection of the individual ought to be uh, how society is organized. This all came from a time where uh, pandemics, black death, plagues, uh, you know, smallpox, all these things, there was much worse pathogens. Yeah, death for sure. At, at a time, humans came up with this stuff. So I think it's possible to to um, to to continue to uh, respect these ideals and practice these ideals, even when risk is higher or seems higher out in the world. And in fact, it may be an argument that, that we, we need to embrace it even more now, right? And so, you know, the, the areas where our system is most fragile is right now we're being told healthcare, we can't get enough ventilators, and masks and all these things. Well, all the, you know, why is it that healthcare cannot rapidly expand in times of demand, like every other corporation or, or organization, like how fast did right. expand? How fast yeah. did all these private enterprise does expand well the reason well, is because and sorry uh, just to are, interrupt you too there there's even been like uh there there have been manufacturers who have are in a completely different industry and all of a sudden they overnight they can change to creating yeah. pieces for ventilators right and stuff like that how can like and that's my question is why can they adapt so quickly yet our our healthcare system just 
seems inept at, at doing that. But sorry, continue your thought. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's because if you understand the healthcare system, or if you've worked in it, you, you know how fragile it is. Um, you know, I have two daughters at home right now here for Easter. They're both paramedics uh, like me, and they are both, uh, while one is unemployed right now, she's looking for work, and the other one is underemployed. She's only picking up the odd shift here and there. Okay. Uh, why is it that, and, and they're not alone. I mean, there are thousands of other paramedics in the province right now that are uh, out of work because of oil and gas. And, you know, they, there's two places you can work in this province. You can work for industry in the oil and gas sector or uh, as a paramedic, or you can work for the government of Alberta, basically, right. on the ambulance. Yeah. So there's, there's basically one place where they can work right now for the government of Alberta. They cannot go, they're, they're not free to start a, a community care paramedic business where they go to seniors' uh, homes where they, they have low mobility and, and implement care plans and, and test their blood and, and uh, coordinate uh, care with the doctor and I mean, th this would dramatically increase our capacity right now so the first thing I would say is we need to take the chains off of we, we need to legalize health care and supply management uh, and, and that sort of thing uh, because that is dramatically decreasing our capacity and our ability to manage um, pandemics like people that get sick uh, the next thing is you know uh, we 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 also need to recognize that, you know, I saw someone post this, they, they were, they were, it was a, a, someone with kind of a green, from a green party philosophy, right? And they, or progressive philosophy, and they were looking, you know, where, yeah. where science is, is, is made out to be, uh, let's say more than it, than it is, right? And sure. I'll, I'll give you a demonstration of that. So he was pointing out that a heat map that showed where people were violating self-isolation where they were going out into the world, right? And it was mostly the Southern states. And he was saying, look at these Southerners who don't even science. Meanwhile, in the <laughs> North, they've imposed lockdowns and you don't see people going out, uh, out, out of outdoors, right? Yeah. And I, I pointed out, I said, look, uh, doesn't science also say that if you sit on your couch, you don't make money or get food? <laughs> um, and uh, he's like, well, well, I said, okay, no, seriously, what does science say about whether I should quit my job right now or not? What does right, it say right. about that? Should yeah. I go to work as a healthcare worker? Well, are you essential or not? I said, it doesn't matter. I yeah. can choose not to go to work. If science says that this is dangerous, shouldn't I just quit my job and stay on my couch? And yeah. my point is like science gives us our is, it can tell us what the facts are, but it can't give us our ought, what we right. ought to do necessarily, yeah. right? So I have to look at these two scientific facts. On the one hand, there's a, whatever, a, a, like maybe a 0.5% chance I'll die in the, uh, and a 20%, if I catch this disease that I have a 20 or 30% chance of catching uh, versus if the risk of unemployment, which is I can't pay the bills and our lifestyle diminishes and our ability, my ability to put food on the table diminishes. Those are two risks. There's no neutral, there, there, this is, there's no non-risky thing I can do here. Yeah. Sitting on the couch right. has its own risks, right? Right. So I have to be free to manage those risks. Now, right now I'm choosing to go to work because unemployment represents a bigger risk to me than this virus. Now things could change. I mean, if, if it were black death out there and I had a hundred percent chance of dying, if I went to work, okay, I'm quitting my job. Yeah. Or, sure. you know, in, in the future, as I get older and my immune system weakens and I acquire comorbidities and I have saved up a nice retirement fund, okay, the risk of going to work is greater than me just quitting my job and handing it off to a younger, healthier generation to do. So right. uh, as a libertarian, I would say, I need to be free to manage my own risk. And in this case with this virus, we've kind of adopted this collectivist thinking wherein if we leave our house, unless it's to go to the grocery store or go to work or do something the government deems essential, we're yeah. putting people at risk. Right. right. And we're kill we're killing people. Well, aren't we killing people by going also to the grocery store or going to right. work? I mean, how, yeah, yeah. how is it that these are different? How is it that pathogens spread differently in grocery stores and in places of work than they do in say movie theaters or somewhere else? So, um, yeah. So, so my point is like, like people need to be free to make these decisions. So, so I would leave it up to, um, individuals to make these decisions to determine for themselves. And, guess what? People, more people are going to get sick because of that. But in, in this case, uh, you know, if I'm asymptomatic, I'm taking on a risk by leaving my house that I might, might get this infection, but so is everyone else. 
So I'm simultaneously posing a risk and accepting a risk that everyone else is simultaneously posing, posing and accepting. Okay. And I yeah. see no problem with that. If I, if I drive on the road, I'm accepting the risk that I might die out there. If I never drive on the road, I can protect myself from that risk. Yeah. If I stay at home, I, I guarantee I'll never get this virus. If I stay wrapped in a cocoon uh, here. Okay. But people need to be free to exercise their own thing. People, you know, and I've I made the argument in this article, you know, I, I once testified at this um, as an expert witness in this uh, constitutional challenge that some uh, medical marijuana, medical marijuana growers brought against the government of Canada, who was going to shut down their ability to grow medical marijuana. One of the reasons I wanted to shut them down was because it posed a public health and safety risk uh, because, and the, the crown brought out all these stats um, that showed increased fire risk for clandestine grow ops. And, and that's true. Right. right. And I, I, I was brought in as the um, expert to rebut their fire uh, experts testimony. And I basically said, look, we, we know that kitchens are the single biggest cause of house fires. And if, and what we don't do is ban kitchens because that would be unreasonable, even though it would get rid of almost all house fires if we banned kitchens. The reason we don't is because we have, we can implement uh, standards. We can have kitchens and cook in kitchens safely, okay? Now, it's not gonna be as safe as banning all kitchens, but people need to be free to live their life. We cannot keep them locked into a bubble. So, yeah. so I said, that's unreasonable. And the judge agreed with me and said, yeah, you're, you know, you're right. And by the way, because they were these grow, when these grow ops became legal, now we have fire safety inspectors helping the helping the grow growers bring their operations up to code and become more safely more safe, so that they're not going to burn down as much. So right. you can do these things safely. And and what we're seeing now is uh, in grocery stores and in other places, we're seeing all these impromptu innovations pop up like plexiglass sneeze guards that protect the cashier from the customer yeah, like yeah. little spacings on on the uh, floor that tell us how far apart we are from each other uh, like hand sanitizer everywhere like wi wiping down buggies and stuff like that okay, yeah and and i just great. want to say people uh these uh companies have been doing this before somebody mandated it to them and they've right. been sort of innovating on their own without yeah. any threat of force so continue right. with that. And, and, and so this is exactly how uh, standards, it, uh, public safety standards develop, right? In, and w what we don't do is ban houses because we want to get rid of house fires. We say, if you construct it in this way and use double, uh, you know, have, have um, doors that swing shut automatically between your garage and, and your home will decrease the amount of CO2 deaths. If we have double drywall in your garage and your car catches on fire, that'll protect people upstairs and give them time to get out like there, there are things we can implement right now yeah. moving forward maybe we should keep implementing these things maybe because we can you, you know you do have a liability as a as a commercial operator uh to your customers if there are risks you can reasonably prevent um you have you kind of have a duty to prevent those risks okay great let's let's implement these standards and they're going to continue to evolve uh, and let people go out. So, so th here's some things, positive things I I'm seeing come out of this. One is people are recognizing how fragile our system is and how we need to, to unchain healthcare to increase capacity. People are becoming more aware of pathogens and how they spread. And, and you know, I'm making the argument in this, in this article I'm writing that we ought to treat the flu as seriously as we treat COVID. I mean, the flu kills hundreds of thousands every year. I see it all the time. I, I see the flu decimate nursing homes during flu season. I see toddlers and children die from this thing. I, I had a 24 year old man once who uh, has had to get a heart transplant because he got the flu. He was otherwise healthy, but he got the flu and it got right. into his heart. Now he needs a new heart. Okay. So the flu is nothing to sneeze at. Pardon my pun. Um, and, and we ought to treat it seriously as well. And so what I'm telling people is, okay, great. Now you're finally noticing that pathogens are serious business and there are things we can do to mitigate uh, the, the danger of that. Um, and we ought to keep doing those things. And yeah. whatever you're recommending. And so my question is going to be when I tweet this article out, uh, what do you think we should be doing now that we should not be doing during flu season, right? Right. And, 
okay, some people are going to say, well, we shouldn't shut down the economy. Okay, well, if we shouldn't shut it down during flu season, can't you apply that same rationale to why we shouldn't shut it down now? Yeah. Right. So libertarians here, we're trying to find the principle behind under underlining all these things, right? And find a standardized way of approaching life that that um, can apply universally all the time. And what we can apply universally is we can try to make things as safe as possible uh, in our houses. We can uh, be aware of germs and, and protect ourselves from that. Uh, but we also have to recognize that that the reason we are so fragile right now is because of healthcare and also because of the economy, which is the next thing. The economy for, why is it that everyone's at risk of losing their house right now, uh, right? Like it might be reasonable during a, a pandemic for people, for businesses to shutter voluntarily, right? They, they just don't wanna take on the risk. But why is it that businesses and individuals don't have any savings right now? Why is consumer debt and, and household debt at an all time high right now? Well, it's because of government economic policy. First of all, they tax us at nearly 50%. Next thing they do is uh, have monetary policy, inflationary monetary policy through the central bank and artificially low interest rates. So in other words, we are incentivizing and encouraging people to consume, 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 because the government, that's the, that is the health of an economy is consumption. Uh, when we notice that's actually production, that's the health of, of society and people need to be able to produce and in order to produce they need to be able to save and when you, you're basically punishing people from saving by artificially lowering interest rates so so we have wiped away people's savings we've loaded them up with debt and that is an incredibly fragile thing to do in the first place which makes our ability to handle a pandemic uh very tenuous at best and and now the government is doing all those things that it did to make our economy this fragile and it's doing those things on steroids and right. what we're seeing now is a, essentially a giant wealth transfer from the middle class, working class, to big banks and to big corporations that are, are in bed with government. And at the same time, we're seeing businesses get wiped out, um, clearing the way for these big corporations to, to go ahead and compete uh, without any competition, to, to operate without any competition. And we're seeing these same banks that are essentially getting bailed out by, by central banks, um, you know, the rest of us are losing our houses because of this economic stoppage and those banks are getting both a bailout and title to real estate right now. So yeah. this is a massive wealth transfer that the likes of which we have never seen. Now you tell me how my dad who is in his late seventies and who has just had a good chunk of his retirement uh, fund um, damaged by this economic shutdown and how now the government is, is going to make what's left of his retirement fund worth maybe half of what it is now by in rapidly inflating the money supply. Yeah. How is that going to affect his ability to buy healthy nutrient dense food? How's that going to affect his ability to, to hire a caregiver to protect him from pathogens? How's that going to affect his ability to, to flourish in the future? How, you know, so, so this is having dramatic effects on our health and, and, you know, what we're doing now, if you thought we were fragile now and, and susceptible to pandemics, what's it going to be like five years from now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I Yeah, and I think a lot of people are being very just perhaps naive about uh, the economic situation and that it can very, very quickly uh, become worse than the pandemic. And, uh, you know, as soon as, as soon, and I've already heard some reports in uh, in other countries of looting and rioting and stuff like that, you know, and they, they have obviously much more fragile supply chains, but uh, our, our supply chain is also really struggling. And um, uh, I've, I've also heard things like we in Ontario and Quebec, they have uh, big agricultural farms where they, uh, but the majority of their workforce comes from the States. Uh, and when it's when it's time when harvest season comes, they're not going to be able to bring that workforce over the border. And so yeah. and and there's going to be they're worried about uh, um, huge strains on our supply chain with uh, just keeping products yeah. on the shelves and stuff like that. And we like so far, the supply chains have done good, but they can't last like this forever. And there will be a reckoning. Right. So there is going to be a huge diminishing returns on shutting down the economy. And it, yeah. it's hard. It's hard because if you say if you say that, uh, you know, like, you know how much I get, I people tell me, well, you just you just want people to die. <laughs> that that must be yeah. that must be yeah. your your mentality. If you 
it, you're, you're thinking profits over people. And it's like, no, uh, things can get really, really bad if, um, if we do not have uh, a functioning economy, particularly, as Absolutely. you said, in the fragile state that right. it, it is currently right. in. Yeah. And, and we have all these prohibitions. You know, a few weeks ago, I interviewed a, a farmer nearby who runs a permaculture, um, like 100% organic, sustainable, like it, it's the most progressive way you can farm ever right okay yeah. and 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 he is he is prohibited from selling his uh product to to customers that want to pay more for the, the high quality uh food that he produces uh he you know and so like this again it's the prohibitions that make us so susceptible to this and and so you, if you want to understand okay maybe there's a case to be made that we don't bring a bunch of infected workers into Canada to uh, harvest right now or something like that. Um, but you can't have that policy at the same time you have made the, the supply chain so fragile by prohibiting people from producing uh, food. You're yeah, totally, you're prohibiting totally. People from producing food. And now you're taking away the farms that we, the, the few farms that we do rely on to to feed us and and it's yeah. incredibly fragile and terrible yeah yeah uh yeah it's a very good point i also wanted to say i was i was actually just talking to my mother-in-law and uh uh my my in-laws are uh they're snowbirds to arizona and they had to f unfortunately come back early uh but they were saying that um the uh the the mayo clinic so, some big uh, hospital down there is they are offering antibody tests for the virus for and sixty dollars a pop, which I think right. a lot of a lot of people would would be more than willing to pay to get the anti yeah. the antibody test just to see if you're if you're already immune to the virus, and then it helps us get a clearer picture as well as how far it's spread and and all that kind of stuff. But you know, it's. Uh, it just why why is our healthcare system i have heard them talking about doing antibody testing but like why can't you just make it why can't you make it so that clinics are uh, able to do that like i mean in canadian dollars maybe it's like 80 or 85 bucks i'd be willing to pay pay that to get the yeah. antibody test you know but, it, but it's it, illegal to do that it's illegal yeah. for you to see <laughs> in your blood i've tried yeah. this before you know I've, i i when i changed my diet i wanted to go on a um on a ketogenic diet a few years back when it wasn't really popular and I wanted to really monitor my blood and make sure my cholesterol wasn't getting out of hand and, and check my inflammation factors, my C-reactive protein, all these things. And, you know, first of all, I had to wait two months just to get in to see my family doctor. Yeah. yeah. And then he wouldn't prescribe the test. He said, uh, no, you don't need this. And, oh. uh, so I went to the, I went to the lab, the blood lab and said, Hey, can I just buy this test? And they were like, no, that's illegal. We can't, we can't sell it to you. And so yeah. Yeah, it, it, we're prohibited from seeing what's in our blood. We can't buy healthcare. We can't sell healthcare. Uh, this makes our system extremely fragile. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, definitely a big concern. Um, anyways, uh, those are uh, really good thoughts and thanks for those stories. I think those are really good. Um, yeah. just as we're landing this plane, uh, is there, is there, uh, can you just plug all your stuff again? Tell us where to find you. Yeah, sure. Well, you can find, uh, stuff about me personally on Tim yeah. uh, You can go to our party page, uh, libertarian.ca. And if you're interested, check out our platform and join, um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Moen underscore Tim. And, uh, my podcast is, uh, the Liberty Experts. And it's on Apple, iTunes, and you'll also find it on uh, YouTube as well. Great. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Appreciate it.